Welcome to Classical Etc., a show that dives into the philosophy, culture, and heart of classical education. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. <laughs> that you tell me to where you leave. Oh, okay. that's the one. Yeah, that's yeah. enough. Be I've had enough from you. you. We're back uh, for another episode of Classical Etc. Wait, that's not for starting. starting. No, we've already started. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back with Dan Scheffler, John Christensen. And for some reason, Mitchell Holland. <laughs> so, fellas, we've brought you together to talk about a very important topic, the topic of leisure. I want to go into this. Have you guys seen the trailers for this new television show that's coming out, directed by Ben Stiller, called Severance? No. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm out. You guys don't watch television. Own it. Do you guys need me to explain what the concept of a television <laughs> is before I explain this? I don't this? own a television. I do own a television, but I, I, is, did, should this be on my radar at all? So I can't speak to the wholesomeness of the show or its credibility. (laughs) However, I can speak to its premise, which is that the characters in the show accept a severance between their work life and their personal life. And when they're at work, they cannot access the memories about their personal life. When they go home, they can't access Mm. memories about their work life. Seems like they are contemplating what is leisure and why do we need it? So that's where we're going. We're going to talk about leisure. But before we get there, I actually kind of want to talk to you guys about your downtime. <clears throat> and dare I say it, your leisure. What are you guys reading right now? Dan, let me start with you. I have uh, recently just dived into Ian McGilchrist's new book called The Matter with Things. Uh, he's he's uh, relatively well known for his earlier book, uh, The Master and His Emissary, which is all on the left brain and the right brain and kind of some recent uh, neurological research on that. And before anybody says, oh, that's all been debunked, this is like cutting edge recent recent stuff, <laughs> debunking the debunkers yeah. uh, a little bit. We'll continue and, debunking debunkers for the rest of our lives. <laughs> good. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with that project. <laughs> awesome. So that sounds pretty fun. John, what are you reading? Uh, I just completed my third read through of Tirant LeBlanc, a uh, 16th century Valencian novel uh, describing essentially an alternate universe where Constantinople never falls uh, through the heroism of a uh, knight from Brittany, uh, Tirant. Uh, and it alternately tells the story of his military conquests and chivalry and also his uh, pursuit of the love of the princess of Constantinople, of the Byzantine Empire. When you say 16th century, was it written in the 16th century or is it about the 16th century? Oh, it's written in the 16th century. It's about basically wow. the middle of the 15th so century. tell me the events that led to your discovering this novel. Uh, oh, how? Um, Time travel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, so uh, in college, I studied Byzantine history and culture. Um, it wasn't my major. It was just classics in general. But uh, my teacher was knowledgeable about a lot of the tradition that both within the Byzantine Empire and beyond, right? That after Constantinople fell, the fact that the chivalric world basically had a foot in two worlds and, you know, the the world of wars on the continent, wars in Europe itself, but also uh, war in the East, right? That Byzantine literature ended up becoming kind of a source of fascination and ends up coloring the chivalric epic in a very significant way. Uh, Cervantes, in fact, uh, described Tyrant LeBlanc as the best book ever written. So uh, it comes highly recommended. <laughs> Mitch, what are you reading? Uh, well, the the wife and I are reading all of the um, the stories of Winnie the Pooh. Nice. Um, is that in, in, in Latin? Or? In Latin, not in Latin. I know that there's this weird Latin translation, but they were not originally <laughs> written in Latin. No, no, in in English. And uh, I'm hoping to read them to my uh, to my child one day. Um, so that's what the wife and I are reading. Um, and then I just picked up, um, um, <clears throat> oh, it's, uh, Pierre Hadot's, um, book on, uh, Marcus Aurelius. What, uh, what's that one? Do you know that one, Dan? Uh, the inner citadel, the inner citadel, right. I just picked it up just a couple of days ago. That's so I'm hoping nice. to finish that. Yeah. That's fun. That's fun. So you guys all read a ton, but it seems like a part of your reading is also working towards different projects that you're writing on. And I wanted to pick your brain on this too, is I think it's going to feed into our conversation about leisure, this ever popular work-life balance, but there's, you know, non-work work work that you guys are doing all the time. So let's talk about that too. Dan, what other kind of work things are you doing right now? 
Uh, well, so I, I, I want to, before I answer that yeah. question directly, I want to go back to this, this Ben Stiller thing because I think yes. it's, it's relevant. <laughs> okay. uh, I don't know anything about this, this movie, but from just your brief description there, it sounds like there's a basic problem of trying to divide work and leisure mm. as mm. though if it's work, it is by definition uh, cut off from everything that we really truly enjoy about life and that makes life worth living. And if it is this other thing over here that's just play and relaxing, I suppose, that 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 has to be cut off from work. And the work is this kind of poison or or disease that that threatens to invade and and uh, kill all the rest of our of our life. Um, and so I want to say that, uh, I mean, I, I, I was joking as we were getting into this that uh, I don't work. Uh, it's all leisure <laughs> for me because uh, I and, and I, I was partly joking, but I think it's there's partly a truth there that I see my writing projects, my teaching projects as part and parcel of what I read when I'm relaxing in bed, you know, before I go to sleep yep. uh, and what I find intrinsically meaningful about uh, my life. And I think if you view your work uh as uh this thing that you hate and that you want to stop doing as soon as you possibly can uh so that you can get to this other stuff which is the leisure then th then that's that's a real yeah. problem um, and that's a good setup for why i kind of wanted to ask this question too because i know that there are things that you're not necessarily maybe being directly compensated for <laughs> that other people would probably look at and say you are working when you're sitting at home and i'm interested in those things well and that's like you know we just need a little bit of a clarity of terms here you know, what do we mean by leisure? Um, because as Dan's getting to this, this idea, we tend, we tend to define leisure as the holiday. You know, when someone says, I went to the beach on vacation, the next question is, what did you do there? Well, I didn't do anything. <laughs> That's why I went to the beach, right? Uh, so is leisure so you and your vacation? Wife always have the fight about are we, are we going to do things or are we just going? Yeah. You're that couple. <laughs> well, I mean, she just, always wants to schedule and you don't. Right, right. The surefire way to get into an argument with your wife is to say, uh, you know, how, how do we philosophically define leisure and are we going to be participating <laughs> in that when we go to the beach? Um, it's a that, surefire that's way. The debate I have every time I want to provoke a fight with my wife. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> yeah, um, but it it raises the important question about how we conceive of leisure normally as a sort of stark divide between leisure and work. Is that really what we mean by leisure? So I think I just think we need to define our and, terms. And Mitch, we're heading there because I think there's an <laughs> intimate connection between the project of classical education and properly understanding leisure. But before we get there, I'm interested to hear what you guys do that's work that's not done at work. So coming back to Dan. Yeah, so uh, to answer the question more directly, uh, w one of the main projects I'm working right on right now is the kind of history of the concept of the person, mm. of the self. Uh, so I've been reading through some of the, the history on that through Plato, through Aristotle, through the early Christian fathers, the Victorines, he, uh, Richard of St. Victor's Trinitarian theology in particular, um, and trying to develop a, I've written some, some articles uh, on that subject, but I'm trying to pull those threads together into a longer monograph form. No, yeah. it's pretty interesting. John, what about you? I, it would be incorrect to say that I'm writing something. I'm sort of like kind of hitting my head on a concept for something I want to write. Um, and I'm not going to tell you what it is because it's such a good idea. It's the next big thing yeah. that if one of you writes it first, <laughs> then I'm, I'm broken as a man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I will simply say it's a, it has something to do with Heracles. And if you want to contact John right now to buy the rights... <laughs> He's listening to offers. I'll give you the prompt if you write it for me and I get all the <laughs> proceeds uh, so I don't, can get out of this writer's block. And Mitch, what about you? Uh, well, I, as, as Dan knows, I'm in the middle of a, 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 my PhD battle. So, uh, and, and as Dan also knows that uh, since he's been through this battle, that it's a slog. And uh, right now I'm working on um, uh, uh, moral philosophy from the perspective of the gospel. So the gospel of Luke, uh, specifically viewing um, um, the sort of portrayal of the human life as a certain, uh, a certain form of life um, that would produce sort of human flourishing. Um, so specifically looking at the travel narrative and the Sermon on the Plain in the Gospel of Luke. 
Yeah. So that's really boring, but uh, that's, uh, that's well, what I'm working on. Well, everyone's PhD is boring, so please excuse me. I've, I've already, I've <laughs> indulged too long. <laughs> <laughs> Though I do think I hear the small threads in there that have to do with, again, the life well lived and the means by which we, uh, we find good in our lives. You're tempting me to talk more about this thing that I know well, no we, one wants oh, to hear about. We definitely <laughs> don't want that. <laughs> but but um. I think it segues nicely into the topic of how does leisure interact That's right. with That's the right. life well lived. All three of you guys, and my, myself as well, we, outside of our work, we're, we're doing things that some people would point at and go, why do you get up early and read that many pages and try to condense them into notes when no teacher is saying, you have to turn this in at this time? And I think all of us would say, for, for pleasure or because we, we love it. And I think that speaks to the definition of leisure. Dan, how would you define leisure or what are the issues we need to think about as we're defining leisure with the mind that we're going to try and connect this to classical education at some point? Right. So, so classically, the, the Greek, relevant Greek word here is skole. Um, in, uh, in Latin, it would be otium, right? So this is what you do when you no longer have to uh, scrape out your existence through backbreaking labor, mm. plowing a field just to get enough calories per day mm. to survive. So once you have accumulated enough wealth that you can dispose of just a few hours in your day extra, what do you, what do, you do with that? Mm. Right. And whatever that is, that is scole. That is Otium. The opposite in Latin is negotium, mm. is business or what you have to do uh, yeah. Of, yeah. of necessity. And so importantly, that doesn't mean play necessarily. It doesn't mean uh, kicking back in your lazy boy watching football and drinking a six pack. Yeah. Okay. Uh, doesn't mean less than that. It, but it doesn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, well, I, I think it. I think it actually does n n need to mean more than that because classically understood, um, that's kind of a, a that's still a fairly slavish mentality. Mm. If if you get done with what you have to do, and the best thing that you can think of to do with those hours is just pure passivity Literal or pure idleness. consumption mm. or entertainment, right? Okay. Well, then, then you. I think you necessarily have um, a kind of slavish conception of your own life. Mm. I mean, mm. a certain amount of that, of course, is is necessary. A certain amount of of kicking it back. Um, but r really, leisure in this classical sense is meant to be directed at something that's intrinsically worth mm. doing. Mm. That intrinsically makes life worth living. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it might be helpful to go a step further, right? Because the Greek word "skole" goes into Latin as "skolia." And then goes into English as school, right? So there's we already begin to see this connection between um, between leisure or scole and knowledge. In other words, knowledge is required for for leisure. There's 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 things about the world and reality that you have to know in order to make in more in order for leisure to be an opportunity for you or a possibility for you. Um, you know, so. It, it, and the other point is, uh, is not just as it's sort of tied to knowledge, but it's, it, there's also a, a sort of quietness that is necessary, which is why sitting in front of, you know, the football game, which is as much as, you know, that should be maybe some form of that should be present in, in your life, right? Just pure relaxation. Uh, there's a more active sort of silent, calm posture to leisure that is um, still restful, but almost an active rest yeah. right a, a rest that is more attuned to what might be received during that rest um and so already we begin to see that that the to define leisure as non-activity is a bit problematic yeah and i want to press into that a little bit but i want to kick it to you john because you mentioned a different latin word right. that you said might might guide us yeah. So again, breaking away from Greek, uh, as one must, uh, the <laughs> I reject the, the premise of the statement. <laughs> the when you were describing the relationship of scole to school, right? What occurs to me is the Latin word ludus. Ludus is typically translated as a game. Uh, again, either a game that children play or the uh, or a sport. Like think of uh, the funerary games in the in the uh, uh, Aeneid, for example. Or Latina Christiana puzzles and games, formerly known as Ludere Latina. Precisely. 
However, in our forms series, we also define ludus not as game, but as school. The word is used interchangeably. It's more properly understood to be a game, but they are both decent translations insofar as they are both activities undertaken by children for their edification, whether it's their uh, edification for later purposes, for some good achieved thereby, or the good achieved in the activity itself, right? So we can use both scole and ludus to say what has already been said, but to simplify as that undertaken for its inherent value, right? That undertaken because doing so is good in and of itself. I think we all can agree that we love leisure um, and the goods produced there. So before we kind of double back to parsing out leisure and what it is, can we can we spend a minute talking about how classical education and leisure leisure are specifically connected? Why do the four of us who will work at a classical education publishing company think of this concept and have ruminated about it? Well, and, oh, go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, as a Latin teacher, one of the you know the significant majority of questions I get about what I do and from parents considering enrolling their children is essentially, what will this do for me, mm -hmm. right? What is the point of learning Latin in a world where Latin is no longer spake? The, <laughs> the, it's really tempting. And for the for many, many years when I first started teaching, the temptation was to speak of the benefits that Latin gives to your vocabulary and its preparation for uh, medicinal and legal terminology and so forth. And yet, not only will the vast majority of our students not become Latin scholars, the vast majority of our students will not become doctors or lawyers either, right? So either it's purely um, professional preparation for a classicist and for doctors and lawyers, or it must be something else. Now, I do think that there are certain kind of secondary and tertiary benefits that come from having the skills of Latin that are themselves worth pursuit besides the language itself. But the whole classical education relies on a on assumption, which is that there are certain topics that will not yield traditional benefit or will not yield secondary or tertiary benefits. And yet to dispense of those things would have invisible costs, right? Um, this kind of thing is typically discussed with reference to the loss of music and arts programs in schools, right? right. But I think it extends as much to things like literature where every school teaches literature, but by and large bypasses the literature that we describe as classical because of some perceived uh, paucity in relevance or, or some, uh, some greater relevance or uh, social engineering in modern literature or something to that effect. Um, classical education suggests that there is inherent value to things and they are worth pursuit for them, their own sakes. And we might add that um, in, in going back to this this uh, sort of connection that Dan made to Scole and to what we now would conceive as some form of school, right? There's, in, again, in order to have leisure be a possibility for you at all, you have to understand something. There's a, there's a knowledge requirement. You have to understand something about the nature of things. If you're going to sort of sit back and sort of actively contemplate and, um, and, and, and allow yourself to sense the wonder uh, the mag the the mystery of things as they've been given to us and revealed. If we're going to, if that's what leisure is, then I have to understand the 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 tendency of things. I have to understand sort of their their ontology, their the metaphysical um, uh, underpinnings of of how things move and 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 like you know table tableness, right? Yeah, and if, if you're going, if those things are going to surprise you, if they're going to um, to if you're going to sit in, in silent contemplation of those things, then you have to understand something about them. And that's what a classical education is doing. It's, it's providing a, a knowledge about the world and about the things in the world, whether that's humanity, you're learning about the tendency of the human soul to pursue virtue and vice. Uh, you're, you're, you're learning about the nature of, 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 of the physical world. Uh, mammals and in, in how they sort of reproduce and, and insects, right? I mean, so every subject is getting at the knowledge required for leisure, for contemplation um, to really occur. And, um, and, and so you, you really can't divorce. You cannot have leisure if you can't be surprised by the mystery of things and you can't be surprised by the mystery of things 
lest you begin to have an education where you get to probe these things. I will. You, you might even define classical education as the leisured education, mm-hmm. right? Um, what I mean by that is uh, what, what have human beings over the centuries thought worthy of doing with themselves once they no longer had to just go and work the fields for 18 hours a day you know uh what subjects were selected as okay now that we have accumulated enough wealth and security yeah i'm going to pass on to you my son and i'm going to send you off to school because we don't we don't have to force you to to just do manual labor for our sheer existence so what as a father what do i want to give my sons and my daughters with that ability with that wealth with that freedom classically it's philosophy and history and science and art and music and all of these mm-hmm. all of these mm-hmm. things because not so that you can go back to the modern fields yeah and grind more effectively away right, right. in a factory yeah. um but but precisely because you've been set free from that condition of life and now uh have the freedom to to pursue that which is intrinsically worth pursuing if i could add one qualification there or i suppose a quantification that that i agree but i wouldn't say that leisure depends on knowledge necessarily or depends on sort of a special knowledge or any more special knowledge than we have as as humans and not animals right that in many respects of leisure are are very much implicit in just being able to to self reflect as we can as rational beings uh to use a to use an example i don't think someone needs a particular education for example or m- much beyond their own ability to kind of passively comprehend or passively appreciate cuisine. Cuisine, I think, is a pretty extraordinarily simple description of a leisurely activity because food has a very functional purpose, right? Nutrition. But most food we eat accomplishes a goal beyond that, beyond nutrition. And either that is pure decadence, gluttony, or the purpose that it's achieving is in some way self, self-fulfilling, but also self, uh, self-evident. Right. Self-justifying. Self-justifying. And but again, (laughs) self-evident. I think the average person, for example, doesn't need to know much about being an Italian, for example, for to to appreciate eating Italian cuisine. Right. And realizing, you know, realizing in some simple uh, kind of pleasurable way that they're partaking in their in their ancestry if they're an Italian American. But I, well, but, well but yeah, Mitch has then, some pushback. Uh, then you can look at something like wine, where wine, I at the risk of offending some some ears, is literally unnecessary. However, you can describe it as a pleasure that is very much quant- quantifiably improved by an education, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like there is enjoying wine and then there is being knowledgeably uh, knowledgeable about wine that permits you to enjoy it in a way that artists can't. I make this differentiation purely because the point of classical education is not merely a gift for the leisure class, right? For a group of people who buy the buy the kind of opportunity of OTM are able to engage in something that other people can't, right? Leisure is something that is available to everyone, but one can still say the quality of leisure can still be quantifiably ranked or quantifiably appreciated on greater or lesser levels, or can one can engage in more valuable or more more um, uh, fruitful leisure activities through one's education. And that is sort of kind of the essential leisure of humanity is purchased through classical education. I want to hear Mitch's feedback because I think he wants to fight you. <laughs> well, I just think, I mean, at the end of the day, I think I, where I would push back, I like where you landed, right? And this is an important question that I think is worth bringing up. If we define classical education and leisure as connected in some way to knowledge or even enhanced by knowledge, which was an important caveat, maybe, um, then are we now saying that leisure is only available to a certain you know, upper class, a certain bourgeoisie, right? Uh, sort of uh, ruling into intelligentsia. And I think that's where we'd want to go back to what we mean by leisure, um, because we certainly don't mean that. Or if we are saying that, then we're sort of cutting off leisure from 
you know, the, the, the most people, most people um, who, um, you know, so it, while I would want to push back against the part where you're maybe saying that leisure does not require knowledge, um, I, I have, a, I did appreciate the caveat of, are, are we, is the end result of this, are we saying that leisure is not possible lest you have been educated at the highest levels of, of, of the classical tradition? Um, you know, so there, there's an important point to be made. I've, there. I've got, I've got two responses to that right away. <laughs> uh, so one is, I think nowadays in the modern world, at mm. least in our in our part of the world, but even in in a lot of the third world, um, we we're not we're not living even remotely close to uh, the conditions that human beings were living in during, say, Plato's time. You know, virtually everyone has ha, has now some amount uh, that is not driven by pure survival necessity. And so virtually everyone does have at least some degree of wiggle room of freedom. Okay, what am I going to do Mm -hmm. with, even if it's just this half hour extra that I have? Um, Now, of course, some people have a lot more than that. And certainly we we don't want to downplay how much that privilege matters, you know, um, but it's a question of what do you do mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. that wiggle room uh, that I think is, is really critical, not, uh, oh, now that I'm part of the, the upper classes and have eight hours instead of a half hour to, to play with, uh, now I can finally have leisure. Second point I want to make is even in the midst of, I was talking about plowing all day. Yeah. Or doing hard manual labor all day, um, there still is also a way of of reorienting the soul, and uh, there's a whole philosophical tradition here that takes that root linguistic meaning of leisure of what you do once you no longer have to go out into the field and and do manual labor, and says no, leisure is is much more of a spiritual condition or a, a mindset about your existence in the world and not primarily what you're, you're doing at, for your economic productivity. So even if I am engaging in manual labor all day, every day, and I literally have no extra time, there is a way of engaging in that in a leisured state yeah. by by taking by re recontextualizing and rethinking what I'm doing as intrinsically worth doing and approaching it with an attitude of wonder and and gratitude. Yeah. This is a very stoic to, uh, yeah, turn uh, right, to right. the well of to return to the well of Ben Stiller. The <laughs> like this speaks to the fact the that true the, stoic. The <laughs> horizontal kind of orientation of leisure, the idea that leisure occupies a space beside work is arbitrary right you're describing vertical distribution of leisure that within again if we describe uh work uh labor drudgery as as a thing undertaken for some other end one can still engage in that in a way where there are other benefits beyond that right again my job is one that i do technically to pay the bills right but i get an enormous amount of pleasure out of doing it right i you know it is it is a means by which I am fulfilled in a way that far exceeds the the you know pecuniary value attached there too. Well, I want to unpack this because I, I think we're going in a very good direction. That is, I want to hear from you, Dan, what it means to do work with this leisurely attitude that you're talking about. Does that mean like to do work leisurely usually sounds like you're just not doing it very, <laughs> at all? But I want to back up first and say I think a good example of you guys were going right towards it. Uh, the question of is leisure possible without knowledge? Mm-hmm. And I think a good example of kind of the two sides of the coin is chestnut checkers, right? <laughs> checkers is, is pleasurable because it's a game, but chess is infinitely more pleasurable because of the complexities inherent in the game. But it's only more pleasurable if you know those rules. And, if, and the more you begin to understand the rules <clears throat> possible, there's more pleasure available to you. And in the same way, John, your point was that you don't have to have knowledge necessarily to find eating food pleasurable, but the more knowledge you have, the more complexities available to you, the more pleasure you can find. And that's kind of the essence of 
the connection between classical ed and leisure. But now you're driving it to another point. That is, how does that affect work itself? How do how do leisure and work relate to each other? Can I can I set Daniel up real quick, just with a historical sketch? Because you know, part of this conversation we had talked about uh, Joseph. Uh, Joseph Peeper, Peeper, Peeper uh, uh, Joseph Peeper's book on leisure, and it's important. It might be helpful just to note some historical context to that book because um, it was written right after World War II, right at the beginning of the Cold War, where you have two ideas about what man is. You have the Western idea, and you have this sort of Russian, sort of communist idea, and at the center of that vision, each vision of man is what is work. Uh, is work for oneself, is work for uh, the state, is what is the political nature of work, um, what are the social ramifications of this. So work is sort of taking on a, a more, has, is sort of playing a more important role um, in the, this German philosopher writing in the, in the middle of all this is not only responding to um, this, it was really just responding to this, this role, the worker. Um, that is sort of emerging um, in a sort of political realm between the West and the East, um, and, and especially with you know in the Cold War, right? And so this question of work, what constitutes work, um, and is leisure is leisure for work? Does leisure serve work, or is leisure something that's you know is the only reason why we have holidays so that we can get back to work and work really hard, right? So you know there's this there's this battle that's sort of emerging. Um, around this time that that this philosopher is writing this book on leisure is trying to sort of push back against, and that's this emergence of the uh, what he would call and what what we had talked a little earlier about about the workaday mentality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, to to answer uh, Shane's question, I would first distinguish between uh, knowledge conceived of as knowledge of a bunch of facts, mm-hmm. and I think this is mm-hmm. kind of what you were pushing against. I don't need to know a whole bunch of facts. I don't need to have a textbook in my head to be able to appreciate fine cuisine or a lot of really good things in life. Um, but there's there's another notion of uh, knowledge classically, and if we want, we can get into all the different <laughs> terms in Greek and Latin for for these these two things. Uh, but knowledge conceived of as wondering vision Mm. or knowledge conceived of as appreciation Mm. for the whole. So a kind of um, act of mind, it's receptive, but it's not passive. It's a kind of active receptivity whereby we look at reality and we see the whole of it. We see the beauty of it. We see the form of it. We see how things fit together. And I would argue that that kind of knowledge really is uh, necessary for the the kind of leisure that that we're talking about. Whether it's even just a simple wine, yes, knowing in the first in the textbook sense, I think will increase your appreciation of wine. But I think even more so. Uh, stepping back and having that appreciation for the form of the whole and how it fits into the rest of experience or the the example of the cuisine or the example of I'm a manual laborer and I and I don't have a lot of free time to kick back in my lazy boy or a lot of uh, extra money, but I'm out there uh, working or I'm working in a factory or I'm doing so. It is possible, you know, uh, to to take that with this vision of gratitude and appreciation for the whole of things and not allow uh, the human being to merely become a cog in an instrumental machine for Mm. churning Mm. out more widgets. So there's a lot of threats then to leisure, right? You know, mass production, you know, the fact that we all have TVs and smartphones and, and yeah, (laughs) and just an infinite amount of little trinkets that can take up our time means that we never actually have to sit in contemplation, a sort of active, uh, uh, receptive posture to, um, to seeing the whole in, in a piece, to seeing the, 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 the many in light of the one, right? Um, so mass production is in sort of the ease, ease by which we can acquire so many things um, in, a, in sort of a modern economy is a, is a potential threat, right? Um, social media, <laughs> or well, let's step back, mass, mass media, it can be just a real threat to leisure. It 
It always podcast podcast <laughs> yeah. just yeah, always stop. always Damn. drawing your attention to something that's not <laughs> a, not a sort of a silent moment of sitting and receiving right and then obviously social media being the, the biggest culprit there i think there I, I do want to bridge your description your secondary description of of kind of leisurely thought in the passive sense or not the passive sense but the appreciative sense as a bridge i think to your original uh, your original question, which was essentially, how does how does the leisure idea arise in the midst of essentially a a culture of labor, a culture of work? Because I think that, I mean, I think we generally speaking agree that someone who only does work is probably not living a fulfilled life, and someone who does no work is probably not living a fulfilled life, right? And that the medium is in the middle of somewhere. But more specifically, I, I mean, I've been pushing this whole time for the view that I try to do no work. Oh yeah, <laughs> true, the, and yeah. get paid for that timeless <laughs> aphorism of you know love your work, you know don't work a day in your life, right? Yeah, that's that's uh, the idea. <laughs> excellent. Um, but if we describe again, if we describe sort of the value system of labor, which perceives good in apprehension, right, of accomplishing something, of earning something, and the good of leisure as comprehension as accepting that which is amidst you, around you, right? The Mary versus the Martha. Then in a way, this becomes a spiritual, like a very spiritual question, because then to what degree does worth, to what degree does our effort relate to worth on any level, whether temporal or spiritual, right? Again, uh, unless one of us is hiding something, we're all Christians in the room, um, the, the entire premise of salvation is appreciation, not apprehension, right? Mm -hmm. Again, for all that can be said about the relationship of our of our actions or our endeavors to living a good Christian life, right? The idea is that salvation is gratis, right? That grace is gratis by definition. And that essentially, in a way, you could say that the leisurely, the the pursuit of leisurely good, again, pursuit is maybe a funny word here, but the comprehension of leisurely good is in a way a microscopic model of ingratiation, right? By accepting and comprehending that good that is freely available to you in the temporal sense, you might better train yourself spiritually to accept that good which is available to you through the, mm -hmm. through the mercy of God. I think we can connect this even back to the central mission of classical education being to equip our students with those internal skills, the liberal arts, necessary to appreciate that which human beings were created to enjoy, the true, the good, and the beautiful. So uh, fundamentally, this is the whole project that we are mm -hmm. trying to work our students towards. And just as one reflection, I, I'm thinking of a very famous modernist author whose last book he wrote was about the IRS <laughs> and about an IRS agent who his entire life is just numbers and the mind numbing processing of numbers into infinitum and coming back to your um statement of the of the threats against leisure one of them is just the the amount of just mind numbing processes mm -hmm. that human beings are fit into to serve others and institutions and societies that do not glorify god and do not serve others and i think that's part of what the church does is it calls us to kind of pull away from these systems that serve yeah. the state or other, you know, and to serve others and to use our efforts and our, our skills that way. It, and it, it might be helpful also to add, you know, if we are talking about threats to leisure, uh, what are things, what things are not threats to leisure? And, you know, obviously one is uh, growing in knowledge, right? There's a sort of, uh, you know, as we increase in knowledge, we are more, more able and more fully able to understand and comprehend the fullness of things, right? We're more able to engage in leisurely activities. Um, but one thing that would not be a threat would be, you know, to be a day laborer, right? Or to be a farmer or to, to be a mother, right? Or to be a father or to be an accountant or none of those things. And this is to dance a little bit to dance point uh, earlier. Um, in the midst of all of those things, there's what what leisure simply requires is a silent moment, a a posture of receiving, you know. So, I, and it doesn't have to be literal silence. Sure, it's part of it, you know, it, it, one of the 
points that Peeper makes is that, you know, even in the midst of a very noisy yeah. factory, you can still have that that an interior silence mm-hmm. that transforms and redeems those circumstances that yeah. you're in. It's much yeah. more about an, your interior state than the exterior yeah. uh, circumstance. Yeah. And, and to go even one step further, we might even begin to describe what, what might occur in the soul when leisure happens. Mm. Uh, you know, we, I just, a perfect example would be, um, you know, it very frequently, my wife and I will engage in some sort of, um, domestic altercation and um and uh I, we usually call you, those just arguments you, is this when you you <laughs> introduce the uh, the, the yeah. topic of uh, uh, debating when you're debating whether you need a the schedule of leisure <laughs> yeah. on vacation yeah, that's right that's right yeah so you know very <laughs> as is common to man to say something he shouldn't uh, to his wife uh, <laughs> um no but very frequently we'll engage in a, in a conversation and i'll be sitting there contemplating something that we're not talking about in the moment and get in trouble for it. Um, but, but sometimes I find myself drawn to just contemplating how surprised I am about my wife, not because she's weird or she disagrees with me, but because she defied what I thought she, she's different than me. She's, she's her expression of femininity is so wholly other. And I'm just mystified, not in a, in a surprised, but or mainly just in a, mysterious kind of way there's she still has mystery to me and it's not always great when i'm having that moment right when my wife is really trying to get a point across a point because <laughs> yeah. i'm smiling and you're she's, beholding the mystery as I'm, yeah. yeah yeah but there's something too even in that moment i i've you know i have maybe found myself um engaging in a leisurely activity where i'm my wife has surprised i thought that i maybe knew her completely but yet she's surprising me and there's a wonder to that. I'm, I'm seeing her afresh with new eyes. I'm learning more at first. If at first I thought that I knew everything about her, uh, she is always continually mystery to me. And that's a wonderful feeling expression. I mean, that's a very, very menial example. I'm sorry, but it's a video, posture of receiving. I hope mm-hmm. this video comes out on your anniversary or something. Yeah. Just so, <laughs> so we need to land the plane. So I want to go around and I want to ask you guys to answer a question. And then defend that answer with one sentence. For our listener, what is a leisure activity that they should pursue in the next two weeks that they may not have thought of as being leisurely? Studying. Defend. (laughs) Uh, Many people conceive of studying as work and this grueling thing that they have to do for school but i'm making it one sentence by stringing it together with coordinating uh, (laughs) conjunction (laughs) but uh i think they can undergo an attitude shift and take up their studying this week as a leisure activity as pursuing something with wonder that is intrinsically valuable and worth doing john mathematics which i admit is a bit of a uh uh uh, Venn diagram overlay with yours, semicolon. However, <laughs> as a sort of ultimate act of seeking the leisurely, the leisurely endeavor in a process or in an enterprise that the substantial majority of my students describe themselves as uh, disinclined to, uh, I think it is valuable. And M dash. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. I think it is uh, excellent, or it is commendable to try and find within mathematics through practice, through back of the napkin calculations of how much a meal costs or whatever, that within mathematics is an order that divorced from its abstraction, thereby abstracted from its abstraction, it can become a template for comprehending the world and uh, relate beauty thereby. A beautiful 17th century sentence. <laughs> Mitchell. <laughs> um, Feeding the chickens. Uh, while I had a lot of other things in mind, uh, I think it's important to remember, as as I think both uh, both the suggestions so far has sort of revealed, it's in this everyday, not not going to the beach type of a scenario, where if we approach that sort of mundane task with a level of openness to receiving a a pure a purely wonderful sort of moment of inspiration 
um, those moments can be pure, can be leisurely. Uh, you know, when you observe now, that's the second sentence. I, I put a period there. I didn't mean to. I just I stopped. I took a breath. I think that was my period. We'll we'll come back to it. feeding the chickens. I think All that's right. self evident. Feeding the chickens is it's a good enough sentence for me. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys for joining me for this episode. I've enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Classical Etc. If you'd like to show your support for the show, then you can leave a like below. If you'd like to add your voice to the conversation, then you can comment. And if you want to follow along with us on this journey, then please subscribe. Thanks, and I'll see you later.